Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I have a text in Ezekiel and in Amos before we read the text for the message, Revelation chapter 10. First, uh, Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel, of course, is a prophet, was called of God, and there's some distinctive similarities, even uh, actual word overlap between Ezekiel's uh, calling of God and, and the one we find in Revelation 10. We'll be reading verses 2, 6 through 3, 3. And you, son of man, be not afraid of them, nor afraid of their words. The briars and thorns are with you, and you sit on scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, for they are a rebellious house. And you shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Be not rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And when I looked, behold, a hand was stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And he spread it before me, and it had writing on the front and on the back, and there are written on it words of lamentation and mourning and woe. And he said to me, Son of man, eat whatever you find here. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me this scroll to eat. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly with this scroll that I give you, and fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it, and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. Now Amos, chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. For the Lord does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy? Now Revelation chapter 10, text for our message today. Revelation 10 and 11 is an interlude between the 6th and the 7th trumpets. And I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, his leg like pillars of fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land. And he called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders have said. Do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay. But in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and I told him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey to my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and language and kings. 
Heavenly Father, we pray now that your spirit would be with us to ponder afresh and with illumined benefit your word this morning. May it settle us. May it strengthen us in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All righty. We're into some new territory here in the book of Revelation, chapter 10, and we find ourselves smack dab between the sixth and the seventh trumpets with an interlude. An interlude is an intervening time between two events. An interlude is what was often called light entertainment that would happen between several acts in a play. Play may be of a serious, tragic, or suspenseful nature, but then there'd be a little interlude between a couple of acts and it'd be some lighter entertainment. The interlude is what that is called. But that's not the nature of this interlude. It's not light entertainment while you're in the midst of some serious judgments. Not at all, actually. Uh, what we have here is uh, enlightening interpretation rather than light entertainment. The sixth trumpet has sounded. The sixth trumpet, remember, it looks like light, but it's a trick. It's a trap. It's not light. It's an illusion of light that actually kills rather than illumines unto life. This is nothing other than the activity of Satan and his minions, even as the Apostle Paul talked about, that Satan comes as an angel of light, and so too do his ministers come as angels of light. But they're not. They only seem to come that way. It's a trick. It's deception. Yet the question then for us then, well, how do you, how do you, how do you detect? How do you decipher? Uh, how do you discern the difference uh, between that which looks like light but is an illusion and that which is light? How do you avoid that deception? And from the very beginning in the book of Genesis, when we first find Satan you know, crowding his way into God's temple sanctuary in Eden, you find that he added to the word when he spoke to Eve. Uh, you shall not uh, touch, even touch, or even uh, look or touch or anything else. Uh, he also not only added uh, to the word, but he also substituted for the word uh, when he contradicted it and said, oh, look, you know, I know God said you'd die, but the truth of the matter is you won't die. And so Satan's thing is to, is to either to add to or to subtract from the word so as to distort and deny its truth, leading you into something that looks like, sounds like, resonates with that word, but no longer is it. That's his primal activity, and that's his current activity to this very day. You and I need a sure word from God. The question is, where do we find it and what does it say? <laughs> and we find it, as our Reform Fathers taught us, in one of the five solas of the Reformation, sola scriptura. That is where you find the Word of God. We have a book, a written text to reference, and we can find the Word of God there. Sola, that means alone. That means don't go looking for the Word of God somewhere else. <laughs> but secondly, well, okay, once I've located it, what does it say? Do I have to have some expert to, uh, tell me what it says? A, a, a priest who's dialed in and connected tell me what it says? Or can I, a regular Joe Loco, a regular old uh, Lady Lucy. Understand that word and benefit from it. And again, the Reformation answered, you betcha. Scripture interprets Scripture. And there are passages that are clear 
that shine upon the passages that are less clear so that you can find your way and have a true and saving confidence in the message of the Bible. And the Apostle Paul even summarized that message for us. In 2 Timothy 3.15, he said to Timothy that the scriptures give us the wisdom to salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. And if you can understand what that little phrase means, the wisdom of salvation by faith in Jesus Christ, and you can confidently rest your head assured that you are in the truth and know the truth. And that Satan's deceptions will not destroy you, but rather God's truth, his word, will deliver you. And so as we read this 10th chapter of Revelation, this is its premier point, is that we have God's book his words written the temple has a text a sure word from heaven well first let's consider the interlude here now this is not something new to us in the book of revelation this is the second time we've seen an interlude we saw the as the seals were being opened, in between the sixth and seventh seal, there was an interlude. That was chapter seven. And now, uh, when we come to the trumpets, between the sixth and seventh trumpet, there's an interlude. And both of these interludes span our, or are concerned with the church age. Both of these interludes, uh, you might say, answer the same questions. What are those questions that they both answer? Well, how does God get his people together? Question number one. How does God get his people together? And second, how does God get his people through? We saw in the first interlude, the way God gets his people together, he seals them. 144,000, the totality of his people, he will seal them all, and he will see them through tribulation into the heavenly regions of safety and of God's worship and blessing together. We saw that. He seals a people on earth so he can <laughs> secure them in heaven. That's chapter 7. There's two halves to that interval. The sealing and the securing them in heaven. He gets them through the great tribulation. And that sealing we can read about in chapter 7, it says there's an angel that ascends from the rising of the sun. There's the picture, a visionary picture of the resurrection, the rising of the sun. Christ is the great and morning star. And the angel comes from the rising, out of that rising of the sun, to the sealing of those 144,000. And that is what the Apostle Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 13 and 14, he speaks of that sealing. And I'll read that to you here in Ephesians. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee or the down payment of our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it. So the seal secures us with the kingdom of God to actually know and to have God's kingdom dwelling in us until that time when we take full possession. We've got a down payment now, full possession is on its way. There's the sealing. The very thing that John is speaking about in the Revelation where the 144,000, the entirety of the people of God, not one will be lost will be sealed for sure. Well, in this second interlude, uh, it also has two halves, just like the first one. Uh, chapter 10 is the first half, chapter 11, uh, through uh, verse uh, 13 is the second half. And again, 
we resonate with what the first interlude was about. And that is chapter 10, the first half, is about the book that God uses. A book that God gave to John and that God will use by way of the Holy Spirit, as Paul said, to seal his people. And chapter 11 is, is the finishing of the temple of its testimony to the truth through tribulation to be raised up in heaven. So we see that these interludes resonate with each other, but it's again, remember, in Revelation, though you have recapitulation, things repeating themselves, they're kaleidoscopic. It's like looking through a kaleidoscope. You turn it, it looks different. Get a different angle on it. And so here we're getting a different angle on something that's already been introduced and introduced between number six and number seven seal or number six and number seven trumpet. And so the interludes kind of, these interludes kind of stop and say, here's the big picture. Here's God's plan of salvation. The salvation plan that the Lamb secured by His blood and the Holy Spirit now is applying to His people so as to secure them for heaven. And so we see from these interludes, we're, we're informed. We, we're, as in we're zeroed in. This is what God's concerns are. You know, God's not primarily concerned with you getting what you want out of life. Yeah. You know, God is not primarily concerned to inquire, well, what are your great dreams? Oh, those are my dreams too. Let's go do that. No, that's not primarily what God's concerned about. Now, it doesn't mean he's unconcerned about what your desires and dreams are. But what he's primarily after is something very, very important. And that is God wants you to identify with Christ and his kingdom and his people. That's what he wants you to be as it is beating in your heart spiritually. Oompa, oompa, oompa. Knowing Jesus and his kingdom and living for it and his people in the new covenant. And as you read these, as you read the Revelation, you can't help but become impressed with the fact that God is intensely interested in getting you evacuated. That is, getting you through this life. And avoiding deception. Avoiding the deception of Satan, or the beast, or the Babylonian or who is all decked out and offering all kinds of pleasures. That's his big concern. <coughs> and that concern God implements through illumination. That's how God delivers us from illusion. Now, illumination and illusion kind of sound alike, but they're entirely different. And that's exactly what's going on in these interludes. There's illumination to escape illusion. There is light to escape darkness. There is truth to escape deception by way of the Holy Spirit renovating your mind in the Word of God. You might think act differently that you might adopt Jesus Christ and his salvation as your life through this world and that means that those who are headed to heaven <coughs> that they might spend eternity worshiping God remember the end of chapter 7 that beautiful picture worshiping before the throne under the Lord's banner under the Lord's presence protective presence those headed toward that great worship of God <laughs> and revelation begins now. And that means, therefore, that the church is not salvation optional, but salvation manifested 
in and through the lives of those who are saved. The Spirit of God brings us to the worship of God in Jesus Christ. Already, ahead of time, as we press on to the great goal together. There's the interlude for you, overview of what those interludes are predominantly concerned about. Now, in this one, we are introduced in chapter 10, in this interview, to this mighty angel. I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, rainbow over his head, and his face like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. And he had a little scroll open in his hand. It says, right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land, and he called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. When he called out, the seven thunders sounded. When the seven thunders sounded, I was about to write. And he said, no, do not write. Seal up the seven thunders. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet of the sounding of the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be finished. It's the word, finished just as he announced to his servants the prophets. <clears throat> so we are introduced to this angel. We see that the angel comes from heaven. Secondly, we see he's wrapped in a cloud. Now, if you're familiar with Lee Iron's podcast, you will know that the name of his podcast is called The Glory Cloud. And it's taken from this pervasive Old Testament reality that the glory cloud was a, was a manifestation, a theophany, particularly of the Holy Spirit. And it speaks of divinity. And there's all kinds of examples of the glory cloud in the Old Testament, whether it be with Israel and its trek through the wilderness, whether it be in the book of Daniel when he saw the Son of Man, or Ezekiel, or Isaiah. Uh, there's many examples, uh, even into the Gospel accounts. In Jesus' baptism with the Father came, there was a cloud uh, there as part of it. The glory of God. He's wrapped in this cloud. So, thirdly, we find there's a rainbow over his head. And we found that in chapter 4, this rainbow with regard to him who sits upon the throne. The uh, reminding us of the Noahic covenant. And fifth, his face is shining like the sun, which harkens us back to chapter 1, when Jesus is seen by John. He says his face is shining as the sun, and he has legs like pillars of fire. Pillars are in the temple structure, Pillars were set up as witness monuments on a number of occasions in the Old Testament. And also the pillars of fire remind us and point us to the pillar of cloud and fire that was the Holy Spirit's presence leading the people of God through the desert. And even now the Apostle Paul says the children of God are led by the Holy Spirit. That's the spirit presence of God. It's his presence of a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, walking on ahead, leading Israel through day and night to their destination of the promised land. So you have these four distinctive qualities of this angel. And then we're left with the question, well, who is this angel? And, uh, and there's where in the room, you know, we have all the different responses of who the angel is. It's a creature, it's a regular angel. No, it's Jesus. No, it's this. No, it's that. And uh, Grant Osborne, in his commentary on the book of Revelation, uh, quotes Greg Beale's commentary 
on the book of Revelation on this question, and he says the following. He says, and this is, I'm quoting now, uh, Beale makes the strongest case yet for the mighty angel being Christ himself. First, he takes the cloud as the divine glory cloud from which God speaks in the Old Testament, paralleling the one like a son of man seated on a cloud in chapter 14, verse 14. Second, the rainbow on his head is the rainbow of chapter 4, verse 3, and therefore pointing to the divinity of the angel in 10.1. Remember, the rainbow had to do with him who sat upon the throne. Third, the face like the sun parallels the description of Christ in 116, and the feet like burnished bronze parallels Christ in 115. Fourth, the description of the angel's activity is built on one like a son of man in Daniel 10 through 12, and the activity of the angel replicates that of Yahweh in the Old Testament. While all this provides strong grounds for Beale's conclusion, this being is called another mighty angel. And this language is not used of Christ in the book of Revelation. So Beale's second choice that the angelic figure of 10.1 is an angelic representation of Christ who therefore possesses Christ's traits is far more likely. <coughs> So, insofar that Christ is never referred to as another mighty angel, Beale demurs from, or uh, Osborne demurs from Beale's conclusions. This is, must be referencing Christ. So, how do we understand this angel? Uh, one of these interpretive difficulties in the book of Revelation. Well, I have concluded that the angel is an angelic manifestation of the Holy Spirit. So now you're faced with view three of now a potential four. You see that the mighty angel is decked out in divinity. And yet... Osborne wants to say, well, it's not divinity. It just looks like divinity. And yet, it's another angel. And what we have is this mystery of identifying it. And I think that if you look a little closer, you'll be able to see that John, by way of vision, is seeing the Holy Spirit. First, of the four descriptions, the distinctive identity is he's wrapped in a cloud, which is definitely the Holy Spirit from the Old Testament perspective. And then fourthly, he has feet of fire, pillars of fire. So you see that in the description, the beginning and end is cloud and fire, pointing us to the presence of God leading Israel through the desert, which was the pillar of cloud and fire identified as the Holy Spirit. But inwardly, we see on the one hand, he has one attribute of the Father, the rainbow, and one attribute of the Son. His face, the sun, is shining like the sun. Now that's what the Holy Spirit would be. The Holy Spirit brings to us the Father and the Son in his ministry. We see he is strong in power. We also see he's exceptionally large. I don't think that the picture we are to imagine as he found a, a little pond on one place he put his foot and put his other place in the water, like I might do someday, whether intentionally or unintentionally. But rather, this is a picture of a large angel straddling over land and sea. What's the picture of The, the picture of, is not a picture so much of a creature, but it, it's, it's, it's a visionary picture of God himself. And then we see him roaring as a lion, which is the Old Testament version of the voice of God. We read it in Joel and Amos, both. The Lord roars from Zion. And from the verse we read in Amos. And so we have here... I believe, a theophanic 
vision of the Holy Spirit particularly. Paul himself said in 2 Corinthians 3.16, the Lord is the Spirit. Christ became life-giving Spirit. So where the Spirit of the Lord is, there the Lord Jesus Christ is there. I'm going to give you three more reasons why I believe this is the Holy Spirit, not to overly work this over. But in so far, you're probably not going to find a lot of people taking this view. First of all, you have the deja vu here of chapter 5. The lamb receives the scroll. But now we have John receiving a little scroll. So the, the, you have similar activities. But the first one is redemptive accomplishment. The lamb receives the scroll for, to accomplish redemp in accomplishing redemption. But John is receiving the scroll to apply redemption, which is the domain of the work of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, for the three reasons more, the chief product of the Holy Spirit is what? The chief product of the Holy Spirit is the Word of God. The chief product of the Holy Spirit is prophecy, like when Ezekiel is tasting the sweet Word of God as God's prophet. He receives that Word and then he incorporates it by eating it and then proclaims it. It's the exercise of the prophetic office. Second Peter, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, we find this. Oops. Knowing this, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture comes from one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were moved or carried along by the Holy Spirit. Prophets speak by way of the Spirit, and when the Spirit is given on the day of Pentecost, distinctly to the new covenant community, its product is word of God. And so what we find in this very text is the product of this angel is a book for John, like Ezekiel, to eat and to preach, to proclaim. There's one last reason. I think we have the Holy Spirit in a vision, a theophanic vision by way of an angel. And that is the oath. The oath. Now, first of all, the Son of God swore an oath to the Father. Remember when Israel said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do? Well, the Lord Jesus swore that same oath when he was born under the law. Jesus promised from heaven itself when God sent Christ to fulfill his will. That was an oath, covenant oath. We call it the covenant of redemption. But the Father also swears an oath to the Son in Psalm 110, as interpreted by Hebrews chapter 7. Very important uh, text to understand, to realize that God the Father also swears an oath to Christ himself uh, as he interprets uh, Hebrews uh, chapter, uh, uh, interprets Psalm 110 in Hebrews uh, 7 verse 20. It says, it was not without an oath for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantee of a better covenant. The father swore to the son by an oath, you will be a priest. And now what do we see here? But now we see the angel, that is, by way of, of revelatory vision, an angel spanning the earth, making an oath to God, swearing to God with raised hand. There would be no more delay, but that his mystery would be finished. 
God's plan would come to its end point. Now you can see how strategic this is. There's question marks. Is, is, is God's plan going to make it? As you probably said about your own life, am I going to make it? And the answer to the question is God's plan is going to make it because the Holy Spirit, by way of oath, has sworn to God there will not be a delay, but the mystery of God will be finished. The redemptive plan of God. Prior it was hidden, now it is manifest, and it will reach its end point. The mystery of God's redemptive plan in Jesus Christ, of gathering together a people from the four corners of the earth and bringing them into heaven as God's great consummate kingdom of priests. It's the angel that swears to God that it will come to its fruition. I have a little trouble imagining an angel being able to carry through on that promise. God himself, that's different. The interesting thing is not only do we have the finishing of the mystery of God in this chapter 10, but in chapter 15, verse 1, with the very same language uh, with, with the bowls of wrath that are poured out, we have the finishing of the wrath of God. Same language, except it's not the mystery of God, it's the wrath of God that is finished. Here is the promise that the mystery of God, his kingdom, hidden under types in the Old Testament, revealed to his prophets in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 3, will be finished. It will make it, despite the opposition, despite its apparent setbacks, despite its apparent defeat. And so this interlude matches the interlude of chapter 7. The sealing of the 144,000 is by the Holy Spirit. The bringing of the mystery of God's purposes is by the Holy Spirit, by way of an oath at a juncture where things are looking iffy. And of course, this word, it will be finished, is the exact same word Jesus spoke from the cross. It is finished. Redemptive accomplishment is finished, complete in the cross of Jesus Christ. But now the Holy Spirit has taken what the Lamb has purchased. And the Holy Spirit now will finish it. In redemptive application. Not one of those purchased by Christ will be missed. The Spirit of God is by oath promise to gather them all up. Now, just by way of interesting point here, this oath that we find here is typologically anticipated in the Old Testament, particularly the book of Genesis. The longest chapter of the book of Genesis is what? Do you know what that is? Anybody want to take a stab at the longest chapter in the book of Genesis? Chapter 24. Chapter 24, when Abraham sends his servant to do what? Get a bride for Isaac. And before he goes out to get a bride for Isaac, what does the servant do? He swears an oath to Father Abraham that he will come back with the bride. He will do what he said, what Abraham once done. And he swore an oath to it, to go after that bride. Father Abraham, of course, is a picture of the father. Isaac is a picture of the son. That servant is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And Rebecca being brought back is a picture of the Bride of Christ. Typologically anticipated, <clears throat> here now seen again by the Spirit promising by way of oath. The finish, redemptive application, all 144,000 and bringing the mystery of God to its finish. <laughs> What's the means that the Spirit will employ? How will the Spirit do it? That is the vital question. How does the Spirit accomplish it? 
And the Spirit accomplishes it by way of a text. He accomplishes it by holding out to John the Apostle Prophet a book. It is a book of prophecy. A book of apostolic prophetic word that itself is a finished product because John says we are not to add to or subtract from this book because this book completes the canon of the apostolic word that the Spirit has given to the church of Jesus Christ. This is a fundamental principle of the Bible and it enjoys one of the five solas of the Reformation. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul said that the temple of the Lord would be built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, their word, revelatory word, Christ Jesus, the revelatory deed, being the cornerstone. Here in the recommissioning of John, we have the apostle prophet to the church receiving the revelatory word and he is to write he is to write it and he is to send it to the churches and that word is sweet because it's a word of salvation but it is also bitter because it's a word of suffering and judgment and of course at this juncture in the storyline we are running up against judgment so the bitterness receives the accent and yet that revelatory word is connected vitally for its content through mirroring to us as in a glass what what does that word communicate what does that scroll communicate? <laughs> the scroll communicates us the Lamb who has purchased a people from every tribe, tongue, language, and nation to be made a kingdom of priests. The mystery performed by Christ, the purchasing Lamb, will be the mystery proclaimed by the Holy Spirit to John and through John to the church so that those purchased may indeed be acquired by the oath of the Holy Spirit to the Father. And the book of Revelation is the capping off of that book, the capping off of that canon and so we can read its warnings in chapter 22 uh, that those who add to it will suffer the plagues in the book or those who subtract to it uh, will suffer the plagues in the book. See, it's referencing the dark activities of Satan in the lives of people to, to in many ways, unwittingly, through deception, reject the word of God. And they must ask themselves, have I in any way added to it? Have I in any way subtracted from it? So let the Catholic Church beware. Let it be warned. Let the charismatic church beware and be warned. Let the Mormons and their other covenant in Jesus Christ be aware and be warned. Because what we have here as part and partial of God's redemptive plan is this simple idea, sola scriptura. And those who tinker with sola scriptura will become tinder for its judgments of fire. But those who keep it, those who keep it, as we find over and over in the book of Revelation, to listen, to keep it, and you will receive blessing. Those who keep it 
That is, those who embrace the Lamb's work through the Spirit's word will dwell with the glory cloud and the fire in the holy city of light forever. Amen. Father in heaven, we pray, grant us to be.